returning, declares the Lord. Have I not said in my word, when the enemy comes in like a flood, I will raise up a standard against him. Surely I have come to deliver this nation from all the plots, all the control, all the manipulations of the enemy. For I have heard your prayers. I have heard the cries of even those that don't even know me yet. But they have cried out and you have cried out and I have heard your prayers and I am going to deliver this land and deliver this people and turn us back to my ways, says the Lord. Continue to pray. Continue to cry out. Continue to travail. Continue to intercede. Continue to stand in the gap, says the Lord. For I am moving and my hand is not too short that it cannot save. For indeed, I will have a great day in this nation once again where millions and millions will turn their eyes to me and they will see the risen Christ. They will see my son Jesus. They will bow their knee and say, how did we miss it? How could we not see when it was so obvious? All of creation was declaring the reality of my creation and my creative ability. Lord, we thank you today. Have your way, O oh God, in this nation. Have your way in California. Lord, turn the tide of death and destruction. Turn the tide of confusion. Turn the tide of bondage. God, we pray, and we thank you for it. We thank you for it tonight. We give you the praise ahead of time. We give you the praise even right now. Oh, those that don't even know you are going to get saved right now. They're being spoken to by you, God, and we thank you for that. We praise you and magnify you. We say, worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Come on, let's say, worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. You're going to have what you paid for. And we say you are worthy. We are. Oh, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. You're wonderful. God, we thank you. You're never early. You're never late, but you're right on time. We thank you, God, that this is the day of salvation. You have prepared the hearts of people to hear the good news. Thank you for the good news of Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Father. We love you, Holy Spirit. We thank you that you're here tonight to manifest your kingdom right in the midst of us. We declare that the kingdom of God is at hand. Sick will be healed. People in bondage will be set free. Those that are cast down will be lifted up. Lord, we thank you. You're the God of deliverance and salvation. And we praise you for that ahead of time. And we thank you for the privilege of calling you Father, calling you Savior, calling you Helper. We thank you for that tonight. We praise you. We promise to give you all the credit and all the glory. And if you agree with that, say amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Come on, yeah, let's give Jesus some praise tonight. He's wonderful. He's wonderful. Wow. Well, my name's Fred Krop. Some people call me Pastor Fred. I didn't start it, but somehow I got talked into it. But anyhow, <laughs> um, hey, I just wanted to say uh, one of the things I've been kind of blessed about is that it, before the, uh, about a year and a half, two years ago, well, before the, uh, two years ago when the drought was really bad, uh, at the end of the year, the Lord spoke to me and he says, the drought is over. And, uh, and so I just, I, it was still we were in drought, and it was January, and I started, I preached a whole series of messages. The drought was over, and all of a sudden, it started raining, and we started coming out of drought, but then it seemed like we went back into it again, and I thought, well, did I really hear God? And so at the end of this last year, I started praying. I said, God, I want it to rain all the way through May. <laughs> Amen. Now, I don't know if it's my fault or not, but I prayed, and I don't care what anybody else thinks. I'm glad. God answered my prayers. I said, I want all the reservoirs full, full, and I've been checking them. Kachuma is like right there. It's, it's coming right up to the top, and so God is uh, doing that. I believe that the uh, natural precedes the spiritual, amen? So the Bible says first the natural, then the spiritual. So uh, you can count on it that God is, I just really want to encourage you tonight that God is hearing your prayers. Don't stop praying now. Don't get discouraged. Don't faint. 
It says that if we, if we don't faint, we win. we win. Amen. The other night we were in our Monday night prayer. Uh, we were just going along praying, and all of a sudden we got on this phrase, he won, we win. He won, we win. <laughs> and so because he won, you win. Come on. <laughs> all right. I'm sounding like some kind of Pentecostal preacher up here. <clears throat> well, tonight I want to, um, I want to share with you uh, something that the Lord uh, spoke to me a few years back. I was praying and um, at the end of a year, and I said, God, um, what, I, I, what can, what, can, give me something that would help your people. How can I, how can I help your people? And the Lord answered me immediately, he says, he said, tell them to stay full. Tell them to stay full. So I, so what I did is I stay full. That's all I got. And so I started looking up every verse in the Bible that talked about filled, full, be filled, get filled up and so on, and I was kind of shocked at what I found out. And so I want to share with you, and as I was uh, uh, meditating on these scriptures, all of a sudden I saw a spiritual law. And uh, there are spiritual laws in the Bible. There's the law of faith, there's the law of sin and death, there's the law of spirit of life in Christ Jesus. So there are spiritual laws that govern our world. Just like there are natural laws, like the law of gravity uh, that governs our world, there's so there are also spiritual laws. And this spiritual law that I'm going to talk about tonight will help you. You know, we, we use the word. I was thinking the last couple of days, I was talking to, um, I was up in San Francisco. My daughter it just wrote a novel, and she launched her novel in, in Berkeley at Berkeley Library and did a big, uh, grand whatever you call it, book opening, book signing things. And uh, while we were there, I, I had a friend who came down from a very large church up in Seattle and I was just trying to share with them about the healing rooms and what was going on here. And I said, well, you know, we, we kind of use the word revival a lot. And they go, oh, we never use that word. I'm like, wow, maybe we use it too much. <laughs> and, uh, and so I started thinking about, you know, the word revival. We just kind of say it all the time. But I want to tell you how you can live your life in personal revival all the time. How many would like to know that? Okay. You know, we spend a lot of time trying to get negative things out of our lives. And you know what? That never works. You know, you're just like, I'm going to stop sinning. I'm going to stop being critical. I'm going to stop hating. I'm going to stop getting angry. How many of you found that the more you try to stop, the worse it gets? Isn't that right? And so I discovered this law, and we'll put it on the screen here. It's called the law of displacement. The law of displacement. Let's put up the definition here. Here's the definition, displace, to move physically out of position like a floating object that places water, to take the place of. Displ displacement means the act or process of displacing the state of being displaced. Um, one of the, just to give you kind of a picture, maybe kind of a weird picture, but anyhow, uh, a picture of that uh, years ago, this is a true story, uh, a pastor in Florida of a very large church he was about to do baptisms, and uh, he was kind of in a hurry, and he was going to get ready to get down. He was going to get himself, get, get into the baptismal, and so, and just, so what he did is he took his pants off, and he put on some fishing waders, and he just put on the fishing, how many of you know what a fishing wader, like they go up to here, and like fly fishermen use them, and so on, and so he gets down in the water with somebody, but he forgets to realize that when he gets in the water, the water is going to rise. And so he started displacing the water, and the water started filling his waders. Now he had a problem. He couldn't get out of the baptismal. In fact, he was concerned he was going to drown. They were filling up. And so he ends up having to crawl out in front of the whole congregation in his underwear. <laughs> and he tells the story later on about this. That's called the law of displacement. Okay, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. Help us to understand uh, how this law works. And we thank you for speaking to us, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. If you agree with that, say amen. amen. So this law of displacement simply means that, that whatever you're full of will determine what your life produces. And so I have several points. I'm just going to give them real quick to you here. 
about how this law works. And here's the first one, and that is, number one, your life is filled with something. You see, there's no such thing as an empty life. It, your life may be filled with fear. It could be filled with doubt. It could be filled uh, with, you know, um, money, thinking about money. It could be filled with all kinds of things. It could be filled with faith. It could be filled with love. It could be filled with joy. But everybody's life is filled with something. And so, so basically, if you're you know, someone tell you you're full of it, okay, turn to your neighbor and say, you're full of it. <laughs> so there's, there's no such thing as an empty life. Now, as I studied on this, I discovered there are more scriptures about negative things filling our lives than positive. In fact, Jesus spoke to the Pharisees, and he said this to them. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you're like the whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and uncleanness. Even so, also outwardly you appear righteous to men, but inside you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. In fact, in Romans, it says that the world, the people of the world, says they're being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whispers and on and on. And so your life is filled with something. And uh, another one of the possibilities was a man named Stephen. It says that he was a man that was full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. So number one, your life is filled with something. You can't say, well, my life doesn't have anything. No, yes, it does. It's filled with something. Here's the second point. Number two, and that is what you're filled with overflows out of your life and out of your mouth. Uh, Jesus said this. He said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things, and an evil man uh, out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. And so what flows out of your mouth, what's the things you say, if you want to know, well, how do I know what my life's filled with? Just stop and listen to yourself for a little while. And as you listen to yourself, you're going to find yourself, in fact, this, my whole counseling as a, through the years, I've pastor, been pastoring for 38 years, and my, my whole approach to counseling is just to sit and listen to people, and then I wait for what comes out of their mouth. Eventually, their heart comes out of their mouth, and then I know what to speak to. I believe that's how Jesus approached people. He knew what was in people's hearts. He just listened to them. And so what you're filled with overflows out of your life. Here's the third thing. And that is that you determine what your life is filled with. Amen. See, it's, it's us. You and I uh, can determine what we're going to allow in our life or what's going to fill our life. Uh, here's uh, in Matthew, um, excuse me, in um, Ephesians, it says this. It says, don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. I was speaking at a church years ago up in Vacaville. At that time, they were meeting in a, uh, they had uh, moved into like a former Safeway store. And across the parking lot, there was a bar. And it was open. And so I'm talking to this congregation, and I go, well, you had a choice today. <laughs> you can either go to the bar, or you can come to the church. You go to the bar and get, get drunk, but you come to the church and get filled with the Holy Spirit. Come on, somebody. And so here, uh, Paul writes, and he tells us, don't be drunk with wine, for that's a waste. That's, that's not going to get you where you want to go, but be filled with the Spirit. So you determine, not anybody else, you say, well, it's, you know, it's, I remember this guy this, that was down in New Orleans, uh, this, this preacher was walking down the sidewalk, and just as he's walking down, this guy comes falling out of the, the bar there, and he falls down on the sidewalk, and he's laying there, and he was a great big guy, and the preacher gets down to him, and he says, hey, he says, uh, what's, what's the, why, what makes you drink like this? He goes, it's my wife. She drives me to drink. And he goes, big guy like you? He says, well, you haven't met my wife. He says, well, I went to his house and met his wife, and I said, buddy, pour me one. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day. Okay. <laughs> so you determine what your life is filled with. 
The fourth thing I want to share is this, and that is what you're filled with will determine the kind of life you live. So it's really, I'm giving you something so simple, but it really is that simple. I found that the greatest truths are really simple. They're not complicated. God just said, stay filled. It's real simple. Just stay full. And and so as you're filled up, guess what? All the negative things start to come out and and, and move out of your life. And so uh, what you're filled with will determine the kind of life that you're going to live. Here it tells us in uh, Proverbs 14, 14, it says, The backslider in heart will be filled with his own ways, but a good man will be satisfied from above. And so I want, you know, if you want to live an abundant life, if you want to live a full life, if you want to live a life filled with God's grace, love, and mercy, and so on, the simple key is you determine what you're filled with, and that's what your life's going to begin to produce. And so instead of trying to get the negative out, you just keep putting the positive in. Can you say amen? Number five, the fifth thing, and that is that how hungry you are determines how much you are filled. So Jesus said it in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, blessed are those who what? Are hunger, hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be what? Filled. And so it's our hunger that drives us. How many of you remember the parable of the man that gave the feast, and he invited all these people, and they all began to send excuses? Uh, you know, one guy said, uh, you know, he, buys, you know, he gets invite, get invitation, and he sends back a, a, report, a reply to the invitation. He says, I just bought a piece of land, and I have to go look at it. Another guy that got the invitation said, I, I just bought a yoke of auction, oxen, and I have to go look at them. Another guy just got married. He says, I just got married. I have to go look at my wife. <laughs> says, and they all began to make excuses. Uh, and... Uh, uh, and, and so what was the problem? You know, the real problem was they weren't hungry. They, they didn't go to the feast because it wasn't because of these excuses. It was because they really weren't hungry. If they were hungry, it didn't matter what else they had to do. It didn't matter uh, about anything in life. And, 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 and so what I, that's one of my prayers. God, make me hungry. I want to be hungry for more of you. I want to be hungry for, to know you better, to know you more, to know you more intimately. Uh, and so, so what you're hungry for is, determines what's going to fill your life. Here's another one, number six, pretty serious one here. If you don't fill yourself with the things of God, the devil will fill you with his thoughts and his ways. So you can't just, you know, well, I'm just going to remain neutral. There is no neutral. Either you're getting your life filled or the devil's going to fill your life. Uh, here's what Jesus said in Matthew 12. He said this, he said, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, it goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, I'll return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. I had it right there, great. Notice this, then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits, more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there, and the last state of the man is worse than the first. So it shall be with this wicked generation. Now, I want you to notice this. I, when I first read this, it says, uh, it says, I'll return to my house, and when he comes, he finds it empty, sw- swept, another version says, and clean. And I thought, well, that's got to be good. But the problem is it's empty. You see, it's not enough just to get, you know, receive Jesus and get saved, I'm going to go to heaven. You've got to get your life filled up. Because if you don't fill your life, and here, here's the thing, one of my great concerns for the, this generation right now is we're not reading the word. We're not reading the Bible. So we're just fair game. The enemy can put all kinds of thoughts in us and, and, and perspectives. You watch the news. You watch this. You watch that. You listen to this. and listen to that. You go to the movies. And all the time, you're being filled with thoughts that are contrary to God. And so we want to think like God. And so it says, he comes and finds it swept and put in order. And he goes and takes out seven spirits more wicked themselves, and the last state is worse than the first. So if you don't fill your life, the devil's going to fill it. Come on, let's say, I'm going to fill my life. That's right. Turn to somebody and say, I'm filling my life. You tell them, you better fill your life. <laughs> Here's number seven, the seventh point. That is, 
what you set your eyes and thoughts on will fill your life. Okay? I, while we were worshiping uh, tonight, it felt like the Lord was saying, just fix your eyes on me. Fix your eyes on me. Uh, one of the prayers I've been praying recently is, Lord, I, w- I don't want five minutes to go by that I don't think about you. Every five minutes, I want you, to, uh, Holy Spirit, would you just bring Jesus to my mind every five minutes? And, and he's going to answer that prayer. Because the Bible says we're supposed to set our mind on things above, not on the things that are on the earth. And so what we look at, what we, and I would say also what we listen to, amen? Uh, I heard a pastor recently talking about, well, we need to go listen to other people's ideas and that, are, that don't believe what we believe and all that. Well, I remember Jesus saying something about be careful what you listen to. I want to be careful what I listen to because it's sowing seed in me that's going to produce a negative or a positive outcome. I like the positive. How about you? Yeah. I like the word blessing than cur- better than cursing. How many like that, right? And so what you set your eyes and thoughts on, what you think about is going to fill your life. And so let me give you a scripture for that. It says this in Matthew. Jesus said, verse uh, chapter 6, he said, the lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? So here again, he's talking about what we focus on. And I think what he's talking about our eyes, not just what we see, but what what is the focus of our life? I want to focus on God. I want to focus on Jesus. I want to focus on the Holy Spirit. I want to set my mind on the Word. I want to dwell on the Word of God. I want those things. I want that. And as I do that, my life's being filled up with the right things. Amen? And, and again, you know, so many times we're trying to be a Christian instead of just letting God transform us into his image. As we fill ourselves up, we start to look, smell, taste, and sound like Jesus. Come on. We start to become like him. It's so fun. Uh, this weekend, I was, um, uh, when I went to my, my daughter's book launch, uh, there was a very variety of people that came, Christians, non-Christians, and so on. And um, her, one of her next-door neighbors showed up. I had never met him before. His name was, his name was Dan. And, uh, and we, all of a sudden, he just started talking. We just started talking. And he's, um, about to, he's at the end of his training to become an opt- optometrist, and he's going to be going out and doing, I don't know how they, it's like doctors, they go to different places and they practice until they fully get their license and so on. So he's just, you know, he starts asking me about what I do. And so I go, oh, I'm involved with this place called the Healing Rooms in Santa Maria. He was like totally interested. He's like, really? Yeah. And I just started telling a few of the things that w- was happening here and, and just the, the, the several things. And he was just like, oh my gosh, I've never heard anything like this before. And I said, well, there's, we have one common denominator. What's that? Jesus. <laughs> it's really all about Jesus. And, uh, and so then, then pretty soon I start to launch into uh, sharing my testimony with him, and he's just totally locked in. He's <laughs> on to my, 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 my uh, well, I, don't, I can't tell you anything about it, but let me just tell you that he was a very lost person. <laughs> and here it was. I was just speaking out of the overflow of my life. It wasn't like I got to witness to this person. I got to tell him about Jesus. I'm just excited. I'm just filled up. You see, when you're filled up, what you're filled up begins to spill out on everybody. Come on. I like to have that picture where Jesus said this. He said, those who... into that situation. And you know what? It does. It does. And several months ago, uh, I w- had just come back from Israel, and I was over at one of the restaurants uh, here in, in the area, and uh, I was just talking to a guy that worked at this restaurant uh, and across the counter, and he looked at me and he said, well, wh- what have you, wh- you been doing? Or something like that. And I said, well, I just got back from Israel. Really? I'd like to go to Israel, he said. I said, yeah, it was great. He said, well, what was it like? I said, well, everywhere you go, you hear a voice. He goes, really? Yeah. I said, you hear a voice. What's that? What's the voice? I said, everywhere you go, the the land is saying, God is real. Jesus is real. (laughs) God is faithful. God is going to win in the end. Everywhere you go. I I wasn't making, I'm just telling him this was my experience in Israel. And he's just, he says, he says, something's happening to me right now. (laughs) 
And, and it touched him. And so I hadn't seen him for, this was last um, June, something like that. And about a week and a half ago, my phone rings early in the morning. I had given him my phone number, and he calls me up, and I won't tell you his name, but he calls me up, and he says, is this Fred? He says, you know what? He says, I'm a pastor's son, but I've been away from God for a long time. And he said, just recently, all of a sudden, my life started falling apart. And he says, I was just going through a bunch of papers I had on my dresser or something, and there was your phone number. And I just wanted to call you up and talk to you. Come on. You see, we're making a difference everywhere we go. And he says, now I'm going to church, and this guy came and prophesied over me and all this stuff. I said, that's great. That's awesome. Well, you and I, that's us. We're, we're wells of living water. We're springs of living water wherever we go. So the more we get filled up, the more people's lives are going to be touched and changed. Where am I? Number seven. Number eight. What you say continually will fill your life. Proverbs says in eight, chapter 18, verse 20, it says, With the fruit of a man's mouth, his stomach will be satisfied. He will be satisfied with the product of of his lips. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat the fruit thereof. Some years back, I don't know about you, but I, I was uh, in a church in Seattle, and um, uh, we're a very blessed church. We had a lot of millionaires, multi-millionaires in our church, and, and um, my wife and I, of course, been Christians for 48 years now, and we've always tithed, we've always given generously and so on, but we, never, we saw these people around us that were just getting blessed. It was like the windows of heaven had opened up over them, and we didn't see any of that. We're just kind of getting by. And, uh, and so one day I'm reading in Galatians chapter 3, and I see this scripture that says, it says that, that, uh, that Christ took our place right on the cross. He became a curse for us that we might be under the blessing of Abraham. Everybody say, I'm under the blessing of Abraham. Okay, so Jesus became a curse. The curse of the law was on him so that you and I could be under the blessing of Abraham. So I see that verse, and I begin to say, I'm under the blessing of Abraham. And I just, every time I prayed, thank you, Lord, that I'm under the blessing of Abraham. If you came by and said, hey, Fred, how you doing? I said, I'm under the blessing of Abraham. It's like, you're weird, man. I said, I don't care. I'm under the blessing of Abraham. And I pray it, and I say it, and I pray it. And I say it. You know what? Nothing changed. We were still in the same kind of, we were making it, but it was okay. And I said it for a whole year. One year later, almost to the day I started saying it, all of a sudden the windows of heaven opened up, and oh my gosh, the blessings of the Lord were coming upon us and overtaking us. And all I could say is that I had changed what I was saying. Come on. So your life is going to be filled up with what your mouth says. Amen. Here's another one, number nine. We're almost done here. Number nine, when you are filled to overflowing, nothing else can get in. When you're filled to overflowing, nothing else can get in. So instead of trying to get the sin out of your life, get the righteousness of God into your life. Instead of getting, you know, trying to get all the negative talk out of your life or negative thinking, just fill yourself with positive thoughts from the word of God. Fill yourself with the joy of the Lord. And guess what? Depression flees away. In fact, Isaiah prophesies he's going to give you the oil of joy for the spirit of sorrow and mourning. Come on, somebody. And so, uh, so what you're filled with, I, often when I do this, I've done this message a couple of times, and I'll do a little demonstration. I'll get a glass that's filled with Coke and Coca-Cola, and then what I'll do is I'll get a big pitcher of clear water. And then I'll just hold the glass over a bowl so it doesn't go all over the carpet, and I'll just start pouring the water into the Coke. And all of a sudden, you watch the color change until after a little while, it becomes totally clear. Because what? We just displaced the negative with something else. Come on, somebody. And so that's the way it works. So it's, it's about being filled. When you're filled to overflowing, and so the key to victory, the key to walking in the life of God is not trying to stop doing the bad things. It's just start doing the right things. Amen. Amen. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 4, 
Well, and he says this. He says, let him who stole steal no longer, but let him work with his hands that he may make some money to share with other people. So the person's problem was, I got itchy hands. Okay? And so instead of stop stealing, he said, no, start doing something good with your hands. Replace the negative with a positive thing, and it'll produce great results and bless other people. Isn't that cool? I think it's cool. Good preaching, Pastor Fred. This is awesome. So when you're filled to overflowing, here's what, uh, do I have the Psalms 23? Is that there? Yeah. Notice this. David says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup, what? Runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. All right, number 10. How do we stay full? That's the question. Okay, great. You got me. I I know I need to stay full. Well, here's the key on how to stay full. Let's just put it on the screen here. Here's some things you can do. You can start doing these right now. First, ask God to fill you. That's a great prayer every day. God, I need you to fill me. See, I think Rick said it the other day. Uh, we have a problem. We leak. And, uh, and so, you know, even Jesus himself, I don't know if you, when you minister, I find that when I minister, I also need to go get replenished. Amen. Because I'm giving out virtue. Virtue is coming through my life, and it goes out, so I need to get refilled up. And Luke 11, 13 tells us that if we ask God for the Holy Spirit, he's going to give us the Holy Spirit. Uh, praise, worship, and thanksgiving. That's one of the things I love about the healing rooms is that, you know, and I'm not talking to this guy the other day. I said, well, we have, you know, we have church every day. <laughs> Somehow I think that's supposed to be how it is. Acts chapter 2, it says they met in the temple and daily. And from house to house, breaking bread and having fellowship with one another, and the Lord was adding to their number those that were being saved. Amen. Wait on the Lord, Isaiah 40. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Stay hungry, Matthew 5, 6. Just talked about that. Be a generous giver, Luke 6, 38. Give and it shall be given unto you. Press down, good measure, running over, shall men pour into your lap. Use your gifts and talents. It's Matthew 25. It's talking about uh, the, the, how he gave talents to certain people and those that invested what their talents. And so here's how uh, their talents, God says, gave them more, gave them increase, doubled what they had, and, so, and gave them greater responsibility. Now, I don't know if I'm just a one-talent guy or a half-talent guy, but I figured out a long time ago I'm going to just use all my talents full on for Jesus. How about you? Don't wait and say, well, well, if I could sing like Carrie Job, then I think I'll sing. No, no, no. Just use who the, the little oil that God's given you. Just invest that. Invest whatever he's put in your life. If you can talk, talk. If you can listen, listen. Come on. <laughs> if you can love, love. Just use what you got, and God will give you increase. Amen. Amen. Speak the word is big, right? If you confess with your mouth. Jesus is Lord, and, and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Uh, again, Proverbs 18, 20, death and life in the power of songs. And then here's the one that I really want to emphasize, because I really think the church, I was interviewing again this, this, uh, this associate pastor from a large church in Seattle, and I said, uh, they were talking about, you know, they have all these people coming and all these new converts and everything. I said, well, do you ever talk to them about getting baptized in the Holy Spirit? And they said, no, we don't. I'm like, what? Acts chapter 2 is called the Peter package. On Acts chapter 2, by the way, I just want to end with this. What does revival look like? It looks like Acts chapter 2. They're in a room praying. The Holy Spirit comes. They're all filled with the Spirit. Peter goes outside. Everybody looks like they're drunk. People are like, what is going on with these people? Peter says, this is, these people are not drunk like you think. This is what Joel the prophet said would happen. In the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even upon my men servants and main servants, says the Lord, I will pour out my spirit. And, and talks about in the last days. And then it says this, and signs and wonders will happen in the skies. And everyone that calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So he explains that. Then he preaches. He preaches the short. He's got to thank God for short preachers. Come on, short message preachers. Because I read his message on the day of Pentecost. It can't be any more than like a minute and a half, two minutes. 
but 3,000 people get saved. Isn't that crazy? I need to preach shorter. Maybe more people get saved. And so here, and here was, are you ready for Peter's message? Jesus is the Messiah. You killed your Messiah. That was his message. <laughs> and it says, and they were all cut to the heart and came to them and said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said, repent, change your mind, turn to God, turn away from your way and go God's way. Be baptized in water, and you will receive the promise of the Holy Spirit, which is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Then it says, with many other words, he went on and spoke to them, saying, save yourself from this perverse generation. It says, and those who heard his word were added that day about 3,000 souls, and they were all baptized. And it says, they all devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, breaking of bread and prayer and, and fellowship. It says, then it says, and they were meeting together in house to house and in the temple and so on. That's what revival looks like. It looks like change. It looks like transformation. It looks like people getting filled up with God every day. And so here it is. I just want to finish with this. Pray in tongues. Now, if you don't know how to do that, we can help you. Amen. How do I do that? Uh, I remember when I got baptized in the Holy Spirit. I was, uh, I was working at this construction site in San Jose. I grew up in San Jose, and, and, uh, and I'd just gotten saved about a couple months before. Never heard anything about the Holy Spirit or baptism in the Holy Spirit, anything like that. And I met these two uh, guys that were uh, sheet rockers on this construction site. They were both saved, and they were way more mature than me. I was brand new in the Lord. One of the guys came to work one morning, and he goes, hey, Fred. I go, what? He says, I went to this meeting last night. And I sat in a chair, and they laid hands on me, and I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, and I spoke in tongues. I said, really? He said, yeah. I said, was it real? He said, oh, yeah, it's real. I said, great. See you later. I walked away. I was pushing a metal, I'm pushing a, 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 a wheelbarrow full of metal parts, and I was mad at God. I'm like, God, he just told me there's something we're supposed to have, and I don't have it. This is not right, God. And it, it, there's something we're supposed to have. I didn't know what he was talking about. I, know, I didn't know what he, speaking in tongues was. I didn't know what he was, what the baptism was. I didn't know anything. I didn't have three classes on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. All I knew is he said it was something that God was going to give us. And so I'm walking along and said, God, I want it right now. And all of a sudden, I started speaking in some Asian dialect. Just started flowing out of my mouth. I, I, I knew it couldn't be me doing it because I flunked out of Spanish because I could never say como se ama or something like that. I just couldn't do it. And now I'm flowing with this eloquent Chinese or some kind of language going on, and I think that I'm locked into this that I can't speak English anymore. And so I walk around for 45 minutes with my wheelbarrow speaking in this dialect, and then I accidentally speak a word in English. I go, oh, you dummy, you can speak in English. Well, I couldn't wait to get to church that night to tell my people at my church that I got baptized in the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues. And I got there early. I was waiting in the foyer for the first victims. <laughs> and... This couple comes in. This was a church that believed that baptism of the Holy Spirit was of the devil. Okay. I didn't know that. <laughs> so they come in. I'm going, hey, guys, guess what happened to me? They go, what? I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, and I spoke in tongues. They took two steps back. <laughs> they go, oh, no, no, no. That's of the devil. It's of the devil? Yes, it's of the devil. Okay. Well, I trust you guys. I'm, I'm no more of that for me. And then about a year later, I, I was talking to some guy, some Christian guy, and I was telling him about how, you know, well, I don't speak in tongues because it's of the devil. He says, he told me just this profound thing. He said, have you ever read the Bible? <laughs> Good idea. So I started reading in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 because they used to say at this other church, that the way you prove it's of the devil was the Apostle Paul in chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians explains how it's of the devil. So I went to chapter 14 and said, I'm going to prove that this is of the devil. And so Paul says, he who speaks in a tongue speaks mysteries to God. Yes, that's the devil. That's right. You don't want to ever do that. 
He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. Yeah, you don't want to be edifying yourself. <laughs> then he goes on later and he says, and I speak in tongues more than you all. Oh my gosh, Paul is of the devil more than everybody else. <laughs> and the last verse says, forbid not to speak in tongues. And I thought, oh, well, I'm back on. Shandai, come on. <laughs> now, seriously, you don't pray in the Spirit enough. Amen? We got to pray more in the Spirit. The cool thing about praying in the Spirit is you can drive and pray in the Spirit. Amen? You won't get a ticket. Driving by, it's like, oh my gosh, I got to give that guy a ticket because he's speaking in tongues. No, you can do it. You can drive in tongues. You can shower in tongues. You can shop in tongues, get better deals. Come on. You can walk in tongues. Come on. You can even wake up in the middle of the night and speak in tongues. And the Bible says when you do that, you build yourself up in your most holy faith and become strong in the Lord and the strength of his mind. So I'm, I'm just going to vote. Let's take a vote. How many want to speak in tongues more? Come on, just pray in tongues. Well, I need an interpreter. Oh, no, you don't understand. There's three different kinds. I won't go into it. I'm going to start talking about tongues here. There's different kinds of tongues. There's the gift of tongues, but there's the sign of tongues, which happened on the day of Pentecost. But then there's the prayer language of tongues. Amen. So it's just a matter of what we're talking about. Yes, if you give a gift of tongues in a congregation, there should be a a, a, a interpretation. In fact, some years back in Australia, there was this church, and this guy drove up in the parking lot, and he had a pet monkey, uh, and he, his, he left the monkey in the car. This is a true story. I'm not making this up. He left the monkey in the car. He went to a Pentecostal church, and they were in there worshiping and everything, and somehow the monkey got out of the car. And he went in the back of the church, and he started talking, and somebody interpreted it. True story, true story. All right, let's all stand. <laughs> this must be comedy night. Okay, sorry. How many vote for staying full? Come on, really, right now. You know what the world needs? It needs to see Christians that are full of Jesus. Come on, not just people that talk the talk, but people that walk the walk. People whose lives shine. I want my light to shine. How about you? Wherever I go, I want my life to shine. And the only way I can do that is just keep getting filled up every day. God, fill me up. So, Father, I pray right now that we would make it our number one priority every morning. We're going to get filled up, filled up with you, filled up with faith, filled up with the Holy Spirit, filled up with the strength of God, filled up with your power, filled up with your glory, filled up with your joy. God, we thank you. We're going to overcome darkness with the light of being filled up in you. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. We redevote ourselves to staying full. Lord, we, I just say what you told me. Tell your people to stay full. I'm telling you, stay full in Jesus' name.